Hello, everyone. Welcome to Coffee with Khan, a podcast where I give you behind the lens look at everything optometry. So whether you're a pre-health, a grad student or a practicing doctor, I hope to provide you further insights into the world of optometry and more. Today's episode is going to be how to become an optometrist from undergraduate to practicing doctor. This has always been highly requested. So let me go ahead and build you a timeline and get you through the whole process. So sit back and grab a cup of coffee and enjoy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first ever podcast episode. Um, if you're new here, let me introduce myself a little bit. My name is Khan and I'm a third year optometry student and coming fourth year in about a week or so. I graduated in 2018 from University of Houston with a biology major and I've stayed in Houston for optometry school. Aside from academics, I'm involved in many extracurriculars such as being president and vice president to organizations, orientation team leader, and TA. Um, in my free time, I'm usually on Instagram. I've been recently obsessed with making reels and TikToks, and I run a YouTube channel where I showcase optometry, pre-optometry, education, lifestyle, and all those fun things. Podcast is new to me. Um, this is a little bit out of my comfort zone, so the first few episodes may be a little rocky, but bear with me. <laughs> so yeah, let's go ahead and get started on today's topic. Let me give you a really quick brief overview of how to become an optometrist, and then we'll dive further in. So it's going to be three to four years of undergraduate. Depending on the optometry school that you apply to, they will require you to have a bachelor's degree or not. Complete all your prereqs. You can look it up online. So most of the prerequisites are the same, but there are some variation, but you can just easily Google that. Um, I think there's one PDF that's floating out there that's updated every year that has all the schools and the prereqs. And remember that you can take the prerequisites up until your admission date. So let's say I apply in September of my senior year and I get accepted in November. I can still take the necessary prereqs, maybe like one or two classes, the summer leading up until my starting date. So that's also possible. Um, then you're gonna take the OET, then you're gonna apply interview and you're gonna get accepted. Very easy, right? <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and jump into undergraduate. So one of my most frequently asked questions is university versus community college. Truthfully, I think a four-year university is more competitive. If they're choosing between two students that basically have the same stats and everything, they will most likely choose the one from a university because a four-year university is more competitive and getting your degree from there, the university is going to think that, hey, like if she's able to do these classes at a higher level, they're probably going to do well in the optometry program. With that being said, if you are at a community college, it's not the end of the world. You can take the prerequisites at universities. That's a way that you can save money. And another way to save money is you can go to university and then just take the other classes at a community college classes such as english um theater and you know all those unnecessary classes so after choosing the college that you want to go to we're going to go with major so science versus non-science and that one it really doesn't matter if you choose a non-science major honestly it kind of makes you look unique because everyone who comes in are either science or something along the lines and we have a lot of people in our class that are engineer major, business majors, nutrition, all those things. So choose a major that makes you more motivated to get up every day and go to school for. Um, that being said, science majors such as biology, chemistry, physics, and all those things, they help you prepare for the OET for optometry school. You're going to be taking all the prereqs by your second year. So if you were to take the OET earlier, you have that option as well. And also just having the basic biology knowledge will help you a lot in optometry school, especially your first year. Um, and also, you know, higher grades and difficult classes really show admission that you're capable of keeping up with the curriculum of optometry school. So if you do a science major, it really helps you out in the long run, but don't push yourself if that's not something that you're interested in. So we'll jump into extracurriculars and there's always the question of how many hours should I volunteer? How many hours should I work? How many hours should I shadow? And guys, there's really no magic number. Do the things that you enjoy and do enough experience so that you can have knowledge of the profession. And my biggest tip is don't overwhelm yourself too much if you're not able to keep up with your grades. Because at the end of the day, extracurriculars are great, but they can only take you so far. So don't sacrifice your grades if you're picking up too many things and you're not able to keep up with all the things that you signed up for. So some of the things you can do are volunteering. And volunteering, it can be anywhere because, you know, if you're not volunteering at eye clinic, that's perfectly okay because you're still giving back to your community. So that's something you can choose anything for. Shadowing wise, people are always asking, how do I get a shadowing opportunity? 
And this is where I say, you know, you have to be proactive. You have to email the doctors around school to see if you can come in. Maybe during an eye exam, kind of sneak it in. The worst they can do is say no. You can join pre-health organizations to stay connected with the people in the field. Um, a lot of pre-health organizations, such as POPs, they had a bunch of volunteering opportunities for optometry. They also had a bunch of doctors or their sponsors. So anytime you go to a meeting, anytime you hear someone speak at a meeting, anytime that you see a name anywhere, you can always just reach out to those people. Again, what's the worst thing they can do? Say no. <laughs> and when you're joining pre-health organizations, it helps you stay connected with everyone that's going through the same thing as you. You know, don't just go home after going to a meeting. Stay in the club, connect with the speakers, ask them to shadow, ask them how their life is, ask them whatever you want. Just be genuine and just really show that you care about them. Um, and don't forget to make friends in the group. These people are going to be your future colleagues. So it's always good to get to know them. and. When opportunities arise, you guys can help each other out. And going through the whole application process alone is really lonely. So if you have someone to go through it with you, to proofread with you, um, share information with you about things that you don't know, maybe they don't know, I feel like at the end of the day, that's more valuable than anything. Working-wise, I feel like if you have time for a job, you should go for it. I worked at two offices during my time of undergrad. I worked in one my freshman year, and then I worked in another one for the next three years. You can choose to work in an optometry practice, which you know would make it more plausible for you to get a recommendation letter and all of those things to get a really good feel of the field. But also working as a scribe hospital or anywhere that shows them that you're able to work with other people and have patient interaction, that's always good. And next we have research. So I know research isn't everyone's cup of tea, okay? <laughs> but find something that you enjoy. I personally hated working in a lab. So I applied for a clinical research program at Texas Children. And I loved it because I was able to interact with patients instead of literally sitting in a lab all day. But one of my best friends, Nadine, she worked in a lab. She completely loved it. And she took a gap year so she can pursue her research. And that is great. Do whatever you enjoy. And if you're curious how to get a research position, again, like every advice I'm going to give you, you really have to be proactive and put yourself out there. All the professors that you've taken classes with, you can always just email them. And again, what's the worst thing they can say? No. Email them and ask them if you can just come in and just work in their lab. Don't expect to be given a project right away when you work. You can start from the bottom. You have to actually work your way up. So how I got on my lab position is I took cell biology and I formed a really nice connection with the professor. And so I asked her if she needed help with the lab. I didn't ask if I can do research. I just asked if she needed help with the lab. And she said, you know what? Wait, yeah, I kind of do. And so I went into the lab and for that whole summer, I kind of worked as everyone's personal assistant. And if I had stayed, then they would have given me more projects to start on. But I just could not sit in a lab in a room surrounded by four walls and see two people every single day so I did not enjoy that at all and so I left it but then I was reading an email from the NSM website one day and they gave us an opportunity to apply as a research assistant at Texas Children where it's a clinical research you get to interact with the patient and I was like yes that's literally me so I applied for that and I got the position and then I did that and I completely I loved it um, I was kind of sad when I had to leave, but, you know, I had to start optometry school. So honestly, whatever you end up choosing, at the end of the day, you want admission to look at your application and say, wow, you know, they are really good at working in a team. They have leadership positions. They engage in the community that they live in. Um, this all shows that they have good time management because they're able to balance extracurriculars with grades. And those type of things go a long way. And whatever you end up choosing, again, make sure that you can be excited to talk about it during your personal statement, during your interview, when you're talking to someone else. Because if you're trying to convince the admission board that you want to go to optometry school and you have nothing to talk about, it doesn't really convince them and it won't help you in the long run. All right, let's move on and talk about the optometry admission test, the most daunting test for every student. <laughs> so I do have a video on my YouTube channel, Shameless Plug, about how to score really well on the optometry admission test. But let me go ahead and just give you an overview of the OAT. When's the best time to take it? I personally think you should take it after your second year that summer. 
the reason why I say that is because that's when you have just taken all of your prerequisites. Your bio one, bio two, ochems, and um, physics, that's when it's the most fresh in your brain. So I think taking it after that summer will be the best because in the chance that you do want to retake it, which is totally fine, by the way, a lot of people retake it. It's really not a big deal. Um, You do have the option to take it the following summer of your junior year. So then you'll still be on time to apply in that cycle. I personally took it the summer after my junior year, but had I not have done well on it, I wouldn't have time to retake it. So I don't recommend you doing that. The OET is scaled from a score of 200 to 400, 300 being the median um, 50th percentile. And you do get your score right after you click submit. You're able to Google the demographic of every class of every optometry school to determine what the average OAT is. So usually the average OAT for an applicant to get accepted is about a 330 to 350. That being said, I think the science portion is the most important one. If you don't do well on the English and math, that's totally okay. Even if it brings down your overall grade, um, they're still going to look at the sciences more. So the OET is broken down into the natural sciences, which is the biology, chemistry, and organic chemistry, and then physics section, the reading comprehensive section, and the quantitative reasoning section, which is the math section. On day of the OET, you get one break, one major break between two sections. They may have changed it since the last time I took it, but I believe the first section is going to be your natural sciences. And then you're going to jump into English and then you get a break for lunch. And then afterwards you do your physics and then you do your math. Um, Every question is worth the same. So there's no penalty into guessing. And again, I made a video on the specifics of how I study. You can check that out. I laid out a plan for you guys to go through as well. So after you take the OAT, this is where your applications come in. Applications open in July of that cycle. And it runs, depending on the school, but it basically runs from July all the way till April. So you have all that time to get your stuff in. And since it's on a rolling admission base, applying early is always best. The sooner you get your applications in, the sooner they can look at your information and process it, give you an interview, or the sooner they can look at your application and say, hey, you know, we want you to retake this or that. That gives you more time to fix up your application. So what you need to apply or you need to finish your prerequisites. I think you can have up to, I could be completely wrong, but maybe like two classes that you haven't taken. You can take it up until the day that you start the fall semester of your optometry year. Um, Letter of recommendations, you need three to four and again for letter of recommendations when you ask professors for letter of recommendations ask for strong ones so you don't want someone who's going to write you a recommendation letter that doesn't even know who you are and when they send it off you just look like one student out of their class of 1000 so for instance i went to university of houston and then i went to university of houston college of optometry so a lot of the students applying to uhco came from university of houston so if i were to get a recommendation letter from just any random person they're going to see the same letter written like a million times so that would not look good um so don't forget as for really strong letters of recommendations or just strong letters in general a few questions that you may want to ask yourself before asking for a letter of recommendation is have you worked with this person closely um do they know you more than just a student um more than one context just like someone in their classroom or do they know you as someone that they worked with in an organization plus they were your faculty or someone you worked under and you shadowed stuff like that so Make sure they know what your goals and intentions are and ask early, ask as soon as you can because you don't want a rushed one and also you don't want them to forget to turn it in because that would be really bad. So make sure that you get all of those done. The next thing you need for your application are personal statements and I'm going to make a next podcast on everything you need to know about your personal statements. So watch out for that. And then supplementary essays required by specific schools are also required in your application. So for UHCO, they only asked us why we chose optometry and what our goals are for the future. And I know that other schools require different things and they need some additional supplementary things. So whatever the school needs, just go ahead and get that done. So OptomCast itself, you just need to fill it out once and then they will send it off to specific schools. Usually after you submit everything, um, the verification process takes about a few weeks to get through. Again, if you apply early, there aren't that many people applying, so it'll get processed very quickly. So once OptomCast verifies all of your information and they're like, okay, we're good, they'll go ahead and send it off to the school that you want to apply to. And so once the school gets it, they'll verify the information and they'll send it off to the panel of faculty of admission. 
So from there, they'll give their feedbacks about the applicant and admission committee can bring the student back for an interview or they'll say, hey, like maybe you should do this and this in the next few months to make your application look better or you just won't get an interview at all. Once that is processed and the student agrees to come for an interview, um, you'll go ahead and do your interview and then you come in and you get interview and hopefully you get accepted. Honestly, if you get an interview, I think you have a really high chance of getting accepted because they already know that they like you on paper. All you have to do now is just show them that you're a really cool person and they'll fall in love with you. <laughs> so Let's talk about optometry school. Once you get accepted, oh my gosh, a question that I get asked all the time is, Khan, what should I do the summer before optometry school? Should I study? Should I do this? Should I do that? No, don't study. Don't do anything. Just relax and enjoy your time because this is your last few months of freedom before you're committing yourself into four years of absolute torture. <laughs> Not torture. I'm just kidding. That was a little exaggerated. But before you give yourself up to go to school. So don't do anything. You don't have to look at notes. You don't have to do anything because optometry school, like I said, everyone comes from different backgrounds. Some people are art majors, some people are science. So they start you off at the beginning like everyone else. So you will get the same information as everyone else. The way they teach you, they teach you from literally day one. So there's no prior knowledge that you need to know or master before you come in. So that's all you need to worry about is just having a good time, spending time with your family, loved ones, friends before you start optometry school. So just relax and just have fun. <laughs> so once you start optometry school, um, optometry school is usually pass fail. There are schools that have grade letters, like my school have grade letters. So essentially at the end of the day, all you need to do is pass. Um, the grades are there if you want to apply for residency. And obviously, um, if you graduate with honors, it looks good. So essentially all you need to do is pass. So optometry school is four years. Um, for UHCO, the first one and a half years has labs and classes the first year for me was honestly the hardest because we were in classes monday through friday and some days we were in classes from nine to seven and i don't know i just don't learn very well that way i hate sitting in a class and i hate being forced to sit through lectures so honestly i skipped basically all the lectures uh, minus the ones that are required and i just study on my own at home so after one and a half years of lectures and labs you are going to take a competency exam, which is a skills examination that shows that you're capable of giving a basic eye exam before heading down to clinic. So then after one and a half years, the spring of your second year, you start seeing your own patients for the first time. And that's really cool. You bring in your family members, they get to get it done for free. You practice on your friends and stuff like that. So you're essentially downstairs giving eye exams. So that's really cool. And you can take your time. This is when they know that you're like a baby and they don't rush you. Or, so that's your time to shine and like do all those things. So that was really fun for me. And that summer after your second year, that's when you start clinic. So you go through rotations such as contact lens clinic, family practice, um, ocular disease clinic honestly is one of my favorite things about optometry school that's when you really show your skills you get to interact with the patient all those things so that was really fun um after that your fourth year is when you do external rotations your rotations can be whatever you're interested in um i personally really like ocular disease so i chose my sites off of what i liked my friend karina loves pediatric and that's something she's really interested in so she chose a rotation site that has a lot of kids and pediatrics um i think she's doing it at texas children so that's really cool if you want to do private practice group practice whatever it is that you want to pursue in the future. I chose two community clinic that were about 70% ocular path and a really high patient count because I wanted to see a lot of patients and I want to see as much as I can. Let's talk briefly about boards. So you take your first boards the spring in March of your third year. Um, you take part two the December of your fourth year and then you take part three whenever you're in-house or you can take it whenever you want. Part three is um, up to you. You just got to take it before you graduate. Um, yeah, so I didn't realize how fast I talked. Basically, that's pretty much it. That's the most basic outline, the most broad overview of how to become an optometrist. I make more podcasts on different ways that you can dive into these different topics a little bit more. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed the first podcast. So yeah, go ahead and follow me on Instagram. Um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I hope you guys are having an amazing day. Thank you so much for bearing with me. If you're listening to now, you're great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, bye guys.